How does a player go from this to this? So there's a famous quote by legendary filmmaker Orson Welles. He said, if you want a happy ending to the movie, that depends of course, on where you stop the story. And if you stop Jake Plummer's story after the 2005 season, you can see how much truth this quote really holds. Jake Plummer was, let's say, a middle of the road quarterback during his playing days. During his time with the Arizona Cardinals, the team that drafted him, by the way, Dude only threw more touchdowns than interceptions one time, which was in 2001. But in 2003, he went to Denver where his efficiency greatly improved. And he even broke John Elway's franchise record for passing yards in the season. By 2005, he made his first Pro Bowl and led the Denver Broncos goes to the AFC Championship. Dude completely turned his career around in Denver, got individual accolades, even managed to find some playoff success. So if we stop the story right there, we got a nice little redemption piece, a nice little happy ending for our movie. But if you end the story just one season later, and bro, you about to leave a the movie theater pissed. Following Jake's most successful season in 05, things would immediately go left. And just a slight adjustment to the sales on the ship of Jake Plummer over the next 15 years would see Jake reach a very different destination than the one he had planned. I mean, generally speaking, we know what this roadmap looks like for a retired mid-level NFL quarterback. You can be a QB coach. You can break down film on YouTube. You can become an analyst for a network. Maybe they can find a spot for you in the booth. But Jake Plummer took a route that is uniquely his own. He chose not to follow convention and maybe he's actually better off for it. So USA Today dropped this article on July 9th. From NFL QB to Mushroom Farmer, Jake Plummer's life altering journey into the queendom of fungi. The article features pictures of Jake looking nearly unrecognizable. Like he just woke up in every single one of these pictures and he's rocking nail polish on his fingers and toes. You see Jake in a big ass warehouse full of a crazy variety of mushrooms. And I'm looking at this thinking like, okay, what the hell is actually going on? But that one simple question leads me down a rabbit hole that includes several long ass articles spanning over the last like 15 to 16 years, a 50 minute documentary, couple more short clips on YouTube, but I kid you not, by the end of it all, I finally understood how a person can go from this to this. It's like it all makes sense now, I get it. And I can promise you that by the end of this video, you will too. So don't even trip, bro. I'm about to lay the whole thing out for you. Y'all know what time it is, man. Chew the Wayne. Yeah, well, I'm no quitter, cause I'ma go, I'ma go, I'ma go get all right, real quick before we jump in, today's video is sponsored by Factor. So Factor makes hitting your nutrition goals easier than ever. They deliver fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your door. I'm the type that when I'm ready to eat, I'm ready to eat like now. And with Factor, there's no prep and there's no mess to clean up after the fact. It's similar to the convenience of grabbing a snack, but unlike them Pop-Tarts you bought for your kid, Factor gives you that quick satisfaction while also allowing you to hit your nutrition goals. Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in like two minutes, faster than fast food. In a wellness market full of unrealistic and unsustainable diet plans, Factor offers a new approach to pre-prepared foods. They include premium, A1 ingredients, and they're all made with integrity. Factor offers great options that makes it easy to stick to my goals. And I'm usually looking for the same thing as most dudes. High in protein, low in calories, and I want it to taste good. Simple, but not easy until factor. So head to go.factor75.com slash flimlow120 and use code flimlow120 to get $120 off. Again, that's go.factor75.com slash flimlow120 and use code flimlow120 for $120 off. Shout out to Factor once again for sponsoring the video. Without further ado, let's get it. So right off the bat, when you look at Jake's childhood, the journey to this particular destination already starts to make some sense. Jake grew up in Boise, Idaho back in the 70s with a set of values that placed priority on family, friendship, and fun 
over money. We as a society have honestly been divorced from these values. So when people make decisions that maximize these values and don't maximize money, we tend to be a little bit confused. Unlike a lot of kids today, Jake and his family didn't take the game of football overly serious. It was fun and when Jake played, he played as hard as he possibly could. But he wasn't the type to stress too much over a game because he kept perspective. It's a game. So that attitude would stay with Jake throughout his high school and college years. But when he got to the league, he can feel things starting to change. The fun game that he loved started to become more of a grind. He was getting beat up on the field, getting yelled at by fans, crushed by media members, but he did what he had to do to find ways to cope. He would constantly remind himself this was still the same game he played as a kid. And although he couldn't maintain it when he could bottle that feeling, he would go out there on the field and ball out. But once he got to Denver with soon to be Hall of Fame coach Mike Shanahan, there was a major issue that was always going to be a problem. Just there festering underneath the surface. Jake played the game best with his happy-go-lucky approach, but his new coach now was pretty much the exact opposite and the two men would clash. And I want to be clear, like just because they had different styles doesn't inherently make either one of them like good or bad. Sometimes different personalities just don't mix, but if I had to place the blame, I would point more at the coach because I feel like the responsibility is more on the coach to understand all of your players and how to make them tick especially your quarterback in today's league coaches understand the value of making their quarterbacks comfortable they utilize schemes that their qbs may be used in college things that they've had success with in the past and they coach the players but they still allow them to be themselves but in this case mike shanahan and jake Plummer never really learn how to coexist. Now there was probably tons and tons of perceived microtransgressions exchanged between these two, but this one particular situation just crossed the line for Mike Shanahan. So in the intro I talked about the 2005 season where Jake made the Pro Bowl and Denver got to the AFC Championship, right? Well according to a 14 year old article from the Denver Post, that off season going into the 2006 season, Jake committed a little microtransgression that might Shanahan never got over. So Jake Plummer gets out of what is essentially the longest season of his entire career. It's been a grind. It's been stressful. His body's beat up. His mental is worn down. At this point in Jake's career, he's been in the league for damn near 10 years. And like a lot of quarterbacks, especially veteran quarterbacks, he likes to get away during the offseason. He needed that time away so much that he was willing to forfeit a $200,000 workout bonus by only attending 85% of the offseason workouts as opposed to 100%. So that's the microtransgression. He missed 15% of the offseason workout. And even after years went by, this was something that Mike Shanahan just could not or would not get over. This is an excerpt from an article published in 2008 three years after Jake retired. In here is a Mike Shanahan quote that openly questions Jake Plummer's commitment based largely on the fact that he missed 15% of the voluntary offseason workouts. Jake is a guy that I could tell going into this year was not as enthused about the offseason program, working out, wanting to be away. He gave up 200 grand because he didn't hit his percentage. Well, when my quarterback is missing, <sighs> Shanahan pauses, John Elway, He's in here 16 years making those guys work because he wants one thing, and that's to win a Super Bowl. But you could tell that after he missed them workouts, Coach Shanahan was no longer all in on Jake because he felt that Jake was no longer all in for the team. That's what he believed, you know? Now, this same article goes on to give Jake's response to this. And Jake was going in, man. You could tell he was deeply pissed about how this whole thing went down. Yeah, I missed some workouts. And you know what? Jake lowers his head to the table and talks directly into the tape recorder. Mike Shanahan, you can kiss my ass for being pissed about that. And you can quote that. I made 85% of my workouts and he's still mad about it. He still brought that up? Give me a break. That's the dumbest on earth but he's got to have me as his leader when i'm out there on a thursday when everybody's half-assing it and just going through the motions i'm the one that's calling shit out saying let's go no one else 85 percent of workouts mad about that and he's still mad about it well if that's the reason i was benched then i'm glad i didn't make those because i don't want to be here every day in the off season you don't get any escape but hey he felt like i crossed him in some way 
And once you do that, you'll never let those things go. If you cross him in some way, he'll hold on to that more than the times that you've done good by him. So Jake's resentment for his old coach just leaps off the page here. And this small ass transgression spawned a feud that believe it or not, would not be resolved for the next whole decade. After coming off that trip to the AFC Championship game in 2005, the Denver Broncos actually got off to a great start in 2006, opening up 7-2. But while the team was winning, Jake wasn't necessarily playing on that Pro Bowl level from the previous year. My dude actually started the season with zero touchdowns and four interceptions and didn't throw his first touchdown pass of the year until week three. Jake would remain the starter through 11 games, but after back-to-back -back close losses slid the Broncos to 7-4, Mike Shanahan had seen enough and brought in the young QB they drafted to eventually replace Jake. The funny part is, if they thought Jake was too lax, they was really about to be in for a rude awakening, bro. Because the QB that they brought in to replace Jake Plummer was none other than smoking Jake Cutler. A lot more physically talented, yes. But Jake's unique personality was on a whole nother level and at times dude would seem completely disconnected even during games. But anyway, moving on. Jake would finish that season with a stat sheet that looked more like those awful early years in Arizona as opposed to the Pro Bowl QB that he had grown into for at least that one season. And despite most people still feeling that Jake was in the prime of his career, after he was benched for Jake Cutler, he never started another game in the NFL. So Jake felt that he had been wronged and was basically hurt because his NFL career did not end the way that he had envisioned. I mean, nobody want their career to end like that. Nobody want to be still in the prime of their career, make it to the AFC Championship game and then get benched the next year and never play again. But with that said, he had opportunities to play again for Tampa Bay and was even pitched directly by John Gruden himself. But Jake had decided during that 2006 season while sitting on the bench that he was done. That love for the game that he felt as a kid was no longer there. And he made the noble decision to walk away from millions as opposed to essentially stealing money, knowing that he could no longer fully commit himself to the game. Dude had been through so much in his career, taking a crazy amount of physical punishment. And at certain points, he felt that his body would never be the same again. But we're going to talk about that a little more in a second. Jake had also lost close friends like the late Pat Tillman. Y'all may know Pat as the guy who left the NFL to join the military following the 9-11 attacks and if you know the story you know that he lost his life while serving in the military and i won't get into the details because that's a whole nother sad sad story all on its own but that was jake's boy they went to college together and they were said to be like brothers so when pat tillman's passing was announced in 2004 jake was obviously hit hard by that and he actually said that he grew his beard out despite people making fun of it because he knew that Pat would love it just on some man stuff, you know? So while some people thought he looked kind of crazy and unkept, this whole look was actually a tribute to his friend. And it's real, bro. Like when people make a drastic change, you don't know what somebody going through or why they're doing what they're doing. So you can ask, but don't judge. After Pat's passing, Jake began to reflect on his own life. It was almost like he just woke up from the matrix in that moment. He realized that he had been living in a football bubble. I mean, living and dying with every single throw, every win, every loss. Yes, this is his profession and he took it seriously, but it's a whole lot more to life. Pat understood that and Jake used to understand that, but at some point, he kind of lost himself in the whole NFL quarterback thing. But this was kind of the moment that would begin to wake him up. But that process wouldn't be completed until a couple of years later when Jake was benched for Jake Cutler. Check out this excerpt from a 2015 Sports Illustrated article. Here, they're talking about Jake at the point right after he got benched. At first, Plummer, who'd been an All-Pro only a season earlier, had been angry about the demotion. Ever the optimist though, he soon noticed the silver lining. Suddenly, he could simply revel in the grandeur of the game, in the sights and the smells of the stadium. He spent pre-game warm-ups playing football golf with fellow backup Preston Parsons. He ate hot dogs at halftime, joked with fans. For 14 years, dude started every game for his college and pro teams, other than the first few games of his freshman and rookie seasons. So now he could finally breathe in the world. I was like, man, this is a blast. 
I ain't studied a game plan. I ain't have a clue what was going on. It was great. Jake then gets pulled off of that sideline vacation and got tossed back into the game when Jay Cutler got banged up. So Jake runs out there and eh, make a dude miss, rolls out, sees his guy wide open, winds up to throw it, but trips over his own feet, throws an interception directly to the damn safety. Just like that, the vacation was over. He walked back to the sideline, get cursed out by Mike Shanahan on the way to the bench, get insulted again by the quarterback coach once he makes it to the bench. He sits down and now there's a completely different vibe. The happy-go-lucky dude who was present enough to take in the atmosphere like a fan attending his first NFL game despite suffering the most embarrassing demotion of his career, no longer had that presence. Once again, he was trapped in his head. The game that once brought him so much joy was now actively taking it away. So this set off a chain reaction of events. The sales were just slightly adjusted and all of a sudden, Jake's future looked a lot different than anybody could anticipate. And the plot twist in Jake's story would now make for a drastically different movie. So after Jake retired, he moved back to a small town in Idaho where he kinda got back to himself, playing handball like his dad used to, taking trips with his family, taking time to make sure Jake was all right. But he still always managed to look out for more than just himself. Now going back to the 2015 Sports Illustrated article and big shout out to Chris Ballard of Sports Illustrated man, this was probably my favorite Jake story that I came across and it's about how Jake had at one point completely divorced his celebrity and blends in so well that people are genuinely shocked when they happen to find out that he played 10 years in the league. Check out this excerpt, in part because of his appearance but mostly because of his demeanor. Plummer is able to live in relative anonymity. One of his handball friends, Ty Barlow, tells how a couple of years ago in Sandpoint, Plummer was volunteering for Meals on Wheels and the organization ran into funding problems. The woman in charge put a hand on Plummer's shoulder. Jake, I'm sorry, we out of money this month, but keep track and we'll pay you for your gas. Don't worry about it replied plumber no jake you don't even got a job bro you have to keep track of your miles you need the money oh no nah, i played in the nfl for a little while i'm good dumbstruck the woman appraised the scruffy man who'd been delivering food for months hold up wait you're that jake plumber bro i love that story because despite the recent publicity that jake's been kind of getting and trust me we about to get into that in just a second but despite the recent publicity you could tell jake ain't out here trying to do something for the spotlight there was no cameras there when he was doing the whole meals on wheels thing we wouldn't even know about this if a friend of jake's didn't just happen to tell the story to the person that was conducting this sports illustrated interview jake worked with this lady for an extended period of time for months according to the article and she basically just thought he was some homeless dude who needed the money Money. Little did she know, he'd actually walked away from more millions to keep playing in the league. He wasn't there with Meals on Wheels for the check. Dude was just trying to put some good energy back out into the world. And funny enough, I'm pretty sure he wasn't thinking like this, but it actually goes back to an old football cliche. You get out of something, what you put into something. You want good energy in his life, put out good energy. You feel me? During this time, Jake even forgave the person he seemed to hate more than anybody, his old coach, Mike Shanahan. See, Jake had taken numerous shots at his former coach throughout the years. Once in 2009, saying Mike's firing was overdue, and again in 2011 when he said Mike wasn't the great coach that Mike believed that he was. And he would basically drop these quotes every time Mike Shanahan would get fired or have like a bad situation happen to him in the press. Somebody will always find Jake, put a mic in his face, and he had plenty of vitriol to spit at his old nemesis. But over time, Jake would come to realize something. While he may have never agreed with Mike's methods, he couldn't deny that Shanahan actually made him a better quarterback. So in 2017, 11 whole years, after his benching, Jake and Mike Shanahan finally met up for lunch and talked out their differences. And recently, Jake has been even more complimentary of his former coach. He was awesome. To come here and have a mastermind, mad scientist that could dissect the defense and find film from 18 years ago that would put us in a good spot in the red zone, he knew the game inside and out and he knew how to build a team around an offense and put me in a good position to succeed. People thought I got a raw deal, but 
I got a pretty damn good deal here for four years getting to run the system we ran and win a lot of ball games. When asked if Mike Shanahan deserved to be in the Hall of Fame, Jake had this to say. I think so, for sure. His record? won two Super Bowls, and just look at his tree and what they're doing now. They're all over the league. That style, teams are trying to copy it. It's not easy. You gotta have the right personnel and the right coaches to do it. But he was a great coach. Of course, we buddy heads a little bit, but who does it when you're a competitor and you're trying to do the best thing? And maybe sometimes it was probably just him being the kind of coach he was, knowing he could bring a little bit more out of me if he just rode me a little bit. And that's what a good coach does. Jake's transition from when he was screaming into that tape recorder to now almost sound like two completely different people. And one reason for Jake's new outlook is obviously age. As we get older, we begin to reflect on things in a new light. But with Jake, it was more than that. Even though he flipped off the crowd one time and didn't always respond to situations the right way, when you kind of look at Jake's entire track record from a bird's eye view, he seems like a really good dude who does not care if you think he's a good dude or not. Like he'll just do what he thinks is the right thing to do and that'll be it. He doesn't expect a pat on the back from it because that's the way he was brought up, do the right thing. During Jake's playing days, he was a volunteer dog walker, started an Alzheimer's foundation and would take things even further after his retirement. So around 2006, Jake became a leading advocate for the medical marijuana movement. He, along with many other NFL players, past and present, have been pushing hard for years to get the NFL to relax its marijuana policies because research has shown that the plant can help with pain relief, prevent seizures and there's even been some research that suggests that it could help repair damaged brain cells something that would obviously interest any 10-year nfl player as we are all aware of the head trauma that can be sustained in our sport i had pain that's why i left the game after 10 years i was just beat down having to take anti-inflammatories all year to get through the season. I ain't like the way my body was feeling. At one point, he had to have surgery on both of his labrums, and during his recovery, he discovered the medical side of marijuana. It helped him out. So even though he was retired, he fought for the right for active players to use it. Jake said that at one point late in his career, he felt like he could barely walk if he wasn't heavily dosed with opioids. He knew that wasn't sustainable, so after the NFL, he wanted to find a different way to not only deal with the pain, but hopefully completely restore his body. This would finally lead us to the USA Today article that chronicles Jake's exploration into the queendom of fungi. So we just talked about how Jake got into the medical side of marijuana. Well, at one point, he even took a job with Dale Jolly and Charlotte's Web, which is a CBD company. It was there where he was first introduced to mushroom extract supplements. Now, these are not the quote unquote shrooms that you've heard about or maybe have experienced. Now, here we talking more like lion's mane which is a mushroom extract supplement that promotes focus memory and improved mood i've actually used this on and off for a couple of years now and one or two of y'all may actually remember me talking to kto about this on the sports therapy podcast a year or two ago well jay started taking lion's mane along with other mushroom extract supplements and began to feel like he was recovering even better from his physical and mental ailments that stem from his playing days and y'all should already know do mo by now once he started feeling better he immediately wanted to let more people know that not only was help out there but it wasn't even expensive so he started a mushroom supplement company called umbo with former ufc champion rashad evans but then the pandemic hit messed up the entire supply chain and threatened to shut down the whole operation but no jake decided he just take matters into his own hands. He came together with three other enthusiasts and co-founded a full-scale medicinal and culinary mushroom farm in Fort Lupton, Colorado, where they can grow the mushrooms themselves. You ain't gotta worry about the supply chain now. And the funniest or most ironic part about this farm, it's only like 30 minutes away from Mile High Stadium where my dude finished his first career. Crazy. Here's a quote from Jake, football players in general, when you come out of the league, your body is beat up. You have so much inflammation. You got head injuries. No matter what you did, you have head injuries. Sports in general, there's a lot of body trauma and a lot of head trauma. And I know that these, had I introduced these sooner into my diet, I would probably feel like I'm in my late 20s or early 30s rather than my late 30s like I feel right now. Even after all the abuse, 
my body feels great. Jake's company that consists of only four people currently only brings in around eight grand a month. So they damn sure ain't getting rich, but the company is still profitable. And according to the article, the mushroom extract market is estimated to more than double in size over the next decade. And honestly, seeing people get more and more into health and wellness and looking for like more natural ways to do it, I actually think that estimate is lowballing it. I would expect it to at least quadruple in like the next five years. As the article continues, they lay out Jake's ultimate goal and his deepest reasoning for getting into mushrooms. For me, my grandpa had Alzheimer's and also doing what I did for a living, I'm trying to do anything that can help me regrow nerves and help me get back to square, which is what I'm feeling. Everybody wants a long life, I would think so. I do, longevity, vitality, not just a long life, but living a good life. Not just in a wheelchair until you're 120. I plan to be 110 and still active. That's my goal. So that was a brief summary of Jake Plummer's journey from starting NFL quarterback to start up mushroom farmer. Here's my takeaway and I'll leave y'all with this. Jake's time in the sport of football cultivated a competitiveness that never went away. But over time, Jake began to value other things in life over the sport so now instead of competing on the field for a trophy dude is aligning his competitive spirit with things that actually matter he's cooked up a game plan to fully recover his body and mind one that would allow him to live a longer and fuller life than most people think possible so you can talk crazy about dude if you want to but to me that sounds like something that's definitely worth competing for. So how does a guy go from this to this? By pursuing the things that are congruent with the values instilled into him as a child, by being fearless in that pursuit, all in after what you believe in, no matter what. Peace. Jake the Snake. It's a good one, man.